Levaud F-8 Crusader, originally known as the F-8U, is a naval jet aircraft and is sometimes known as the last of the gunfighters. It first flew on March 25, 1955, and variants of this particular aircraft wouldn't be retired in America anyway until 1987. Other countries used it as late as 1999. It was a pretty successful plane, as you can imagine, and it spawned two major derivatives. One was the LTV A7 Corsair II. This was a subsonic derivative, meant for ground attack duties. And it was also very successful, not being retired in America until 1991. But there was one more, Daughter of the Crusader. The X F8U-3 Crusader III. A much more radical modification, it sported a lot of modern additions and had exceedingly impressive performance, especially at the time. But they weren't accepted into proper production or service. Why not? While Vought was still ironing out both the F8U-1 and the F8U-2, they were also working on a larger design that was meant for much better performance, originally called the V-401. This aircraft did have some basic similarities with the other Crusader derivatives, but in reality it didn't share very many components with them. It was designed to be something much more futuristic, and it was powered by a Pratt & Whitney J75P5A, which generated 29,500 pounds of force of afterburning thrust. Speed and maneuverability were the big pushes with this design, and, and they weren't joking about the speed thing. Some of the design specifications called for it to potentially be able to approach Mach 3, though it is worth mentioning that not only did the prototype never even get close to that, but it also uh, should never have done so. The operating speed of the prototypes was no more than Mach 2.32. The reason for this is it because it couldn't in the technical sense. The engine probably could have driven it that fast, but the problem was both the windscreen and the mostly aluminum construction. The actual build of the prototype couldn't tolerate kinetic heating at speeds of more than Mach 2.35, meaning that if it went any faster than that, it would start to break. Uh, and I didn't, didn't want to risk that issue for obvious reasons. So the prototypes never approached Mach 3, as some sources suggest, but they were working on modifications to the design with even better materials that could have gone even faster. So later versions, if they ever existed, might have been able to actually do that. One of the more striking characteristics of this aircraft was the Ferry Scoop Air Inlet, as well as two rather large ventral fins. The inlet design was meant to handle such high speeds, without causing serious issues to the airframe or stability, as air traveling that fast tends to be a bit more un unstable, but this design was proven to limit that issue. As for those two rear-mounted fins, well, those come down during high-speed flight. They rotated up during landing, and that was again needed for the high speeds, for added stability. The single vertical fin wasn't enough. It needed those two additions. And in addition to the turbojet, they also made provisions for a Rocketdyne XLF-40 liquid-fueled rocket motor. <laughs> On top of that, so, you know, just, just very fast. Speed was everything. It just, just, just gotta make it as fast as possible. And the Crusader 3 nickname might confuse a few of you, because you're probably like, wait, wait, there was no Crusader 2, though. There was just Crusader. Why, why is it 3? And that is correct, it was just Crusader. But the Dash 2 variant was sometimes called Crusader 2, so internally, Vought called this one the Crusader 3. A total of five of this aircraft would be produced for testing purposes, and it first flew on June 2nd, 1958. It was part of a competition for a Mach 2 Plus Fleet Defense Interceptor, and its main competition was the legendary McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom II. Both aircraft would participate in fly-offs against each other, and early on, Vought was very confident because, frankly, the Crusader III prototype completely outperformed the Phantom II in pretty much every regard, at least every regard that they were considering. 
It was much more maneuverable, potentially faster, and had a better thrust to weight ratio of 0.97, almost unity, whereas the F4H was at a respectable but lower 0.87. It seemed that the Crusader III was set up to be Vought's next big thing, and the Navy's next principal fighter, but in the end, the Navy didn't choose it. They chose the Phantom II. Why? That doesn't seem to make much sense, because, I mean, the Crusader III was doing better, right? Well, some people say that, but the truth is that the Phantom II did have significant advantages over the Crusader III. While technically the Crusader III's performance in some regards was better, it was not better in both crew management as well as flexibility. The Crusader III had been designed specifically to be a dogfighter and an interceptor. It did these two things. And it did them really, really well. But the Phantom II could do both those things as well as do ground attack duties. The Crusader III could never have been effective in that role, whereas the Phantom II was much more flexible. It was much more of a multi-role jet than the Crusader III was. As a related component to this issue, at the time, the perception was that the age of the gun was over, and that all planes would use missiles in their armament, and not even bother with guns anymore. Now, uh, over the years, it was proven that no, actually, <laughs> actually, it is it is nice to have the option of a gun in a in, in certain situations. It, the missiles are not a guaranteed kill. Uh, also, early missiles were somewhat unreliable. The Phantom II suffered because of this, and granted, the Crusader III didn't have a gun either. But Vought had made provisions to allow for the installation of one. However, more intrinsically, the Phantom had a much, much higher payload than the Crusader III. The Phantom could carry way more into battle, thus enhancing the ground attack role, as well as just flat out having more missiles. It was a safer bet, even in an air-to-air -air war, because it would have more of the thing it needed whereas the Crusader III was more likely to run out of armaments, no matter how maneuverable it may have been. And the Phantom had two engines. The Crusader III only had the one, and the Navy really likes two engines. Not only was this still in the age when certain jet engines were notoriously unreliable and had a habit of failing no matter how well maintained they were, but the Navy's always liked having two engines because they don't like their pilots having to ditch in the water. And an extra engine means that even if one fails, well, you could still fly, generally speaking, but the Crusader III only had the one. Phantom II had, well, two. And as fun as the Crusader III was to fly around in, pilots loved it for that, in terms of actually using it in a battle situation, particularly on the intercepting role, it was a nightmare. This is because you only had one crew member in the Crusader III. It was a single pilot jet. Pilots in this role were very easily completely overwhelmed with the workload that was required when flying the intercept phase in conjunction with firing Sparrow missiles. The Sparrows needed constant radar illumination from the firing aircraft in order to actually hit their target. And this was in the age prior to computers that could automatically do this sort of thing, or at least help out with it. The pilot basically needed to do this all on their own as well as fly and keep track of enemy fire and, and everything else. It was tremendously taxing in order to actually do this. The Phantom II, though, had a radar intercept officer. They were two-man jets, not one. And the radar intercept officer, or the naval flight officer, could share the workload, do the radar illumination thing, while the pilot handled, you know, the flying. And that meant the Phantom was way easier on their pilots than the tremendously unforgiving Crusader III's. As a result of all of this, the Crusader III was not selected, and the Phantom was, going on to have a tremendously long lifespan, serve with a variety of militaries all over the world, and be one of, if not the, most famous Cold War jets. The Crusader III, on the other hand, has been largely forgotten, though the prototypes did have at least a little bit more life in them when it came to NASA. See, one of the other benefits the Crusader III offered was that they could fly above 95% of the Earth's atmosphere. They could go really, really high. And when the Navy didn't want them, NASA did, because they were tremendously useful for atmospheric testing. And the planes did well in that role, helping NASA with a whole bunch of different studies. And, uh... <laughs> and a little bit of trolling. 
they did a little bit of trolling. A lot of the pilots that worked for NASA were also former Navy, and the ones located at NAS Patterson River got into the habit of just playfully, just for funsies, just kind of performing unannounced interception <laughs> on Navy Phantoms that were training nearby. They would get into mock dogfights, and the Crusader Three pilots had a habit of toasting the Phantoms just because when they were in a dogfight, they were better at it. They were much more agile. This sporadic nonsense went on until the Navy finally contacted NASA and told them to knock it off because it was annoying. So NASA had to tell their pilots to please, please stop trolling the Navy. Okay, we know. We know. We know these planes are better at that one job. They know that. You know that. We know that. But stop trolling them. Because they're gonna get mad. And we need funding, alright? I'm just saying. Sadly though, despite this success, despite how loved by pilots they were, and despite the fact that NASA used them extensively, in the end, all five of the prototypes were scrapped. Not a single one being held for preservation, which is a real shame, because I think at least one being in a museum would have been really cool. They're a unique piece by far, a very interesting airplane with distinctive characteristics that aren't shared with many others. I totally understand why the Navy went with the Phantom. In fact, I actually agree with the decision. The Phantom was just more flexible, and that's what they needed at the time. The Crusader III was too specific in its role, even though in its role it was really, 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 really good. It just couldn't do anything else. But at the same time, it still was a really good plane, and I think at least one of them deserved to be, well, preserved. Sadly though, that is not what wound up happening, and these unique aircraft are nothing more than a memory now. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.